Welcome to another episode of the Africa podcast. My name is Mikey Mhenna. Today on the series, we have Rami George Khouri, who is the co-director of the global, of global engagement at the American University of Beirut. He's based in New York. He's an internationally syndicated political com- columnist and book author and journalist in resident at AUB. He's also the non-resident senior fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School. Rami was the first director and is now a senior fellow at the Isam Ferris Institute for Public Policy and International Affairs at AUB and was the executive editor of the Beirut-based Daily Star newspaper, the editor-in-chief of the Jordan Times, and was awarded the Pax Christi International Peace Prize in 2006. Rami, welcome to Afikra. Thank you, Mikey. Glad to be with you. It's really nice to have you here. Um, you know, how does it feel to sort of have to straddle both worlds between um, New York and Lebanon, you know, and just in the bio, it seems like you have to be in all these different places. How does that feel? Given your job, how does that feel? It feels very natural because I've done this all my life. Uh, Our family is Palestinian from Nazareth. My father went to the United States in 1947 as a journalist to cover the partition debate on Palestine at the UN and couldn't go back to Palestine after Israel was created and stayed in New York, worked, got a job with the UN and all his life has been was with the UN. And his work took us from the New York to Geneva, to Beirut, to other places. And all my life, I, since birth, I, I was born in New York in 1948. And uh, I've been going back and forth between North America, Europe, and the Arab uh, world. So I just grew up with this multinational, multicultural environment. We spoke Arabic at home always, and all my education was in English in different places, and a little bit in French when I went to France for a semester in college. So it was just a natural thing for me when I graduated from college in 1970, and then I did a master's, and it was natural for me to go back to the Arab region and work in journalism, which is what I've wanted to do since ever since I started studying journalism at Syracuse University in 1968. And uh, and I went back to the Middle East where I wanted to live, but I worked in English and therefore my work was heavily linked to the English speaking world. And uh, I edited English language newspapers and magazines in the Middle East. I corresponded for people like the Financial Times, the Washington Post, Boston Globe, um, and did a lot of stuff, uh, interviews with you know BBC, NPR, all kinds of international English language media. So this biculturalism has been a kind of genetic part of a chromosomal part of my upbringing, and I'm very comfortable with it, and I'm very grateful for it because it allows me to understand uh, how things work, both the good things in both worlds and the nutcases and the criminals in both worlds. Yeah. Um- if you think back to that 1968 version of you who was interested in studying journalism um, and you contrast it to the students that you come across in 2023 who are interested in studying journalism, what's different about their incentives or their interests in the profession? There's a big difference. I, and I interact with journalists both in the United States and in the Arab region in uh, uh, Lebanon, uh, Jordan, Um, I'm on the board of uh, uh, the Northwestern University Journalism School in Qatar. And so I I interact with a lot of students all over the place. And I keep, I'm still teaching and and giving workshops all over the place. And there's quite a big difference. Uh, The global nature and the digitized nature nature of the media today uh, makes it largely a commercial driven entertainment business. Whereas in 1968 and 1970, when I got my BA, and 1973, when I got my master's, the the media was not globalized. There there was only local media. You've got the local paper, maybe a weekly magazine. And then the only thing that was kind of globalized was the radio. So you could listen to the BBC wherever you were, or or some TV stations broadcasted internationally. But uh, today it's very different. Um, Journalists are motivated by... Uh, more of a desire to make a social comment today, and broadly speaking, of course, uh, uh, they're interested in uh, 
being on the global uh, media stage, which is social media, podcasting, uh, radio, television, Netflix, all of these things. Um, and they're also interested in serious things. So, you know, Me Too, women's rights, Black Lives Matter, anti-colonialism, uh, social justice. Uh, these are big issues uh, yeah. that drive young uh, students. And my teaching at AUB, when I teach uh, different courses, I teach opinion writing and I teach a narrative long-form journalism, always, without exception, uh, the two uh, or three biggest topics that the students always want to write about when I give them an option. They want to write about sexuality in society. They want to write about sectarianism, with Lebanon particularly, but it's also spreading across the region. And they want to write about refugees, because uh, these are three things that dominate their lives. Uh, these things were, were not big factors back in 1968. Uh, so people back then were focused much more on uh, local stories, um, you know, feature stories, political stories, wherever they could find them. Uh, it's, so the media has evolved uh, in many ways, but the evolution of the media globally is pretty common. I find yeah. the polarized, commercialized, digitized, weaponized, uh, and ideologicalized nature of the media and the commercial nature of the media is pretty uh, dominant everywhere. You know, the Middle East, Europe, North America, parts of Africa, India, it's, it's, all, it's, it's all the same, uh, which is a problem. Uh, yeah. But at the same time, it's an opportunity. And people, you know, sometimes they ask me, uh, what do we do? I say, well, just use the good things that we have. I'd rather live in today's world than in 1968. I mean, today I can sit here with my laptop and a phone and have access to the most amazing uh, knowledge at my fingertips. Uh, just this morning, I got an email from somebody I never heard of, some group in London, I think, and they they just launched the uh, the uh, well-being report of countries all over the world. And this is an analysis of different factors of wealth and well-being and uh, income and other things, and they take every country in the world. And so this is an amazing tool to have. And it just came on my phone while I was drinking my coffee. And, yeah. <laughs> and so this is the today's world. I'd rather live in today's world, but you need self-control to minimize the entertainment stuff. It's I still, I like the entertainment. I, I always watch dog cat videos. I watch a lot of sports, uh, comedy. Uh, so there's great stuff that we get on the social media and the and the various platforms that stream things. Uh, but you've got to really be uh, able to control yourself and not get sucked into uh, this uh, terrible world of, you know, focusing on uh, Donald Trump or uh, movie stars sure. who get divorced yeah. or stuff like that. Let me ask you, OK, so um, a huge part of your work is primarily focused on educating new generations of journalists. Um, there have been no shortage of pieces, think pieces focus on the um, the systemic changes of journalism as an industry because um, of the uh, the commercial success of the op-ed. Yes. Um, and now it's almost, I feel like it's becoming increasingly hard to find reporting. Everything is an op-ed. Um, and that's definitely true on a global stage, um, and, and of course in the United States. Um, but when you're teaching these new generations of journalists, do you feel like there is an interest in understanding how to do the nuts and bolts of reporting as opposed to um, opinion pieces? I think a minority of students, maybe one third, are really interested in that core responsibility of journalism, which is reporting, research, analysis, writing, and sharing it. Uh, to try to get to either the truth of a situation, the facts, uh, or to analyze a situation that's complex where the facts are clouded, but to analyze it fairly so that uh, all sides of a controversy are given. I, I would say a third of the students probably still really want to do serious journalism. And two thirds are less interested in that and more interested in, um, in you know, getting famous or making a statement or uh, 
writing tweets or, or stuff like that, which I, I write tweets all the time, and it's a useful thing as long as you can keep it to a minimum and, and control it, and also yeah. combine serious stuff with lighthearted stuff. Um, so, I mean, this idea, though, because like I feel like there's there's a there's a responsibility that the academy has from what to dissuading <laughs> two thirds of these students <laughs> from going into this field if they're not interested in, in the core competencies <laughs> of the field, right? Yes, <laughs> it, there is, and uh, the problem with that is that the academy, like the media reflects these bigger trends in society. Yeah. I have to be fair, though, that I, and uh, this is based on serious personal experience for over half a century, the Western universities in Europe, North America, a couple of other places, I know Europe and North America best, um, still focus, the ones who teach journalism, communications, media, uh, they still focus uh, heavily on, on that uh, core mission. Uh, the ones in the Middle East, in the Arab region and, and other countries, for the most part, uh, are controlled by governments. And therefore, they governments in our region, by and large, and there are really no exceptions now. There used to be exceptions. There used to be some Arab governments, uh, uh, sometimes Turkey, sometimes Israel, occasionally, who really, you know, they, they allowed good, serious media to exist uh, today, most of those have closed, down, shut down, not shut down, but but closed in. And there's an autocratic right wing dominance of politics, and therefore the media, and therefore a slowly uh, education. Um, so the the ability of institutions of learning and teaching to promote uh, the best kind of journalism, those opportunities are uh, more constrained now that you still have little bits here and there, little islands of excellence, mostly due to the work of individual professors. But uh, by and large, the whole Middle East, Arab, Iranian, Israeli, Turkish, the whole Middle East uh, has uh, shifted and is joining the global bandwagon of, of autocrats and thugs who run societies. Yeah. So in my intro, um... I mentioned two of the um, the newspapers that you were very closely associated with, the Daily Star and um, the Jordan Times. Um, I grew up in Lebanon, and I grew up reading the Daily Star. Um, from your right now, I don't I don't think you're associated with any specific publication, right? Yeah, my my column that's syndicated is still syndicated by Agence Global in the United States, but that's a syndication agency, and it sends okay. it out to perfect. And, okay, so uh, you're well suited for this question. Okay. <laughs> and the question is, what what publications across the region do you feel like are are doing sort of still doing this um, the hard work of reporting um, across the region, like? I'm sitting in Beirut. If I want to start, if I want to read stories, um, both investigative journalism, but also just reporting on what's happening in in Tunisia right now, or in Jordan, or in Baghdad, um, or in Khartoum, or Cairo, or um, Jeddah, you know, what are some of the newspapers that people can go to that have very serious journalists who are not only focused on the op-ed page, but are really interested in uh, reporting? Well, there are some, and not surprisingly, they're almost all online, and most of them, not all of them, but most of them are outside the Arab region. Um, but some of them are in the Arab region. So by uh, far and away, um, with no comparisons at all, the, the big source of credible, up-to-date, um, you know, socially and politically responsible reporting and analysis comes from online platforms independent digital media, people like Meda Masr uh, in Lebanon, uh, uh, Public Space in Beirut, uh, um, Heber in uh, Jordan. Uh, there's a lot of, there's dozens of these all over the place. Um, and they are still, those are still, those three I mentioned are still operating from their own countries. Uh, um, Daraj also in Lebanon. There's many uh, institutions like this online very courageous, very serious. Uh, by the way, mostly run by women, which is fascinating, but a sign of the times. Uh, and uh, by local women, 
and um, shout out to Lena Lena Heber. <laughs> oh, absolutely! All you know, all of these groups uh, uh, are uh, active. They're, they're some of them struggle to survive for funding, but they do. Uh, and the governments occasionally try to shut them down, but they, they keep going. And then you've got people abroad um, in Europe, mostly, and so you've got people like. Uh, um, uh, well, you've got the Jazeera um, online in Qatar, which is funded by the Qatari government, but it's pretty autonomous. Um, and you've got uh, the New Arab in London, which is uh, also Qatari funded, but I think quite uh, quite good. I write for them now and then. Um, you've got a uh, few others in, in London. and so, the, But it's all digital online media. The traditional printed newspapers and magazines uh, Really, there is there isn't a single one that stands out as as uh, uh, really uh, serious uh, and and credible, uh, which is which is a shame. But it's a sign, it's a sign of the times. Uh, if you look at the universities in the Arab world, you look at the some of the um, um, training institutes, government agencies. Most of them have deteriorated because they're controlled by governments and, and security agencies. Uh, the one sector that is still vibrant in the region, which has a link to, which also does op eds and analyses, is the sector of research institutes, think tanks, uh, policy centers, and surprisingly, that sector has flourished. You know, the Assam Fadis Institute, which I founded at AUB when AUB asked me to do that in two thousand and six, is flourishing uh, now under Joe Bahut, the director, uh, and and so are think tanks in many Arab countries where they're allowed to. They they're not allowed to work well in all countries, but um, in uh, in Qatar, uh, in uh, some of them in North Africa, uh, and, and, a, and a couple of others here and there. But they do really really serious analysis research and increasingly publishing. What's fascinating about the world, if you mentioned op-eds, and one of the reasons I write less now in terms of writing op-eds, I used to write two a week for about 40 years, um, is that uh, all the institutions of the public space in the, in the world, the public sphere, that are serious about current events are all doing our pets. So you, you get, you know, TV, CNN, MSNBC, they, BBC, they all do analysis and op -eds. All the think tanks in the region and the world that focus on the Middle East, they all write op -eds. Uh, All the research centers, all the, uh, many of the academic institutions that are, you know, Harvard, Columbia, Sorbonne, University of London, whatever they may be, they have Middle East centers and they write op-eds as well as doing, and they all, by the way, do podcasts. So there's been a convergence in the uh, global arena of knowledge, analysis, and opinion about the Arab region, uh, a convergence in the kinds of materials that are offered to the public, almost always for free, and a lot of these materials are really good. Not all of them, but a lot of them are really good. And they're all available for free. So if you want to start a new podcast today or you want to start a new column about the Middle East, you better be really, really good because you're competing with hundreds of other offerings every day that are free and available at your fingertips. So that's an interesting uh, part of the, um, the, of the scene of knowledge, uh, publishing, and uh, and opinion sharing. The social media, uh, the Twitter and the Facebook and all of those have uh, allowed this sphere to grow, ironically, because you can reach a lot of people uh, by just putting it on your, if you have a lot of Twitter followers, uh, you can reach people all over the world. You have no idea who they are or if they're really people, but they're there. Uh, but it also opens the door to wild, people and, and intellectual skinheads and nutcases attacking each other and calling each other names. Uh, so you've got to, you know, this is a package, this is human nature. So the media is a reflection yeah. of two things. It's a reflection of human nature, all of us as humans, but it's also a reflection of the political cultures we live in. <clears throat> and the political cultures we live in uh, have uh, almost <clears throat> everywhere in the Middle East have become more autocratic and more authoritarian, less tolerant, less pluralistic. <clears throat> Sorry. And um, 
and the political culture in the West pretty much uh, has avoided a large scale shift to the right, though there is some shift to the right, but you have different kinds of controls there on, on, on the media. So if you look at the US and the UK, for instance, and they're reporting on Ukraine today, it's fascinating because uh, they, they have one line, they all wave the flag, uh, they you know, support the troops by and large, and it's very hard to deviate from that. Uh, uh, if you look at reporting on Israel uh, and Palestine, it's still heavily pro-Israeli, though there are changes slowly taking place. But it takes a long time uh, for the media in the Western world to break away from the groupthink uh, herd mentality uh, that is defined and often uh, indirectly funded uh, yeah. by, gov by government. So this, these are dimensions of the media world we live in that are yeah. uh, important to, to acknowledge. But in the final analysis, you and me are individuals, and there's 8 billion of us around the world. We can all open our laptop and have access to, to thousands and thousands of websites on the Middle East. And we've got to be able to choose what's good and what's not so good, what's accurate, what's fair, what's useful, uh, and, and what's true and what's false. It's 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 yeah. a, it's more responsibility on the on the audience, the listener, the viewer. I want to go back to this um to the the your time at the Daily Star. Cause I, I was really fascinated by that in preparation for this um this podcast. Um how long how long were you at the Daily Star? I started my first job at the Daily Star right after I graduated from from college in uh, 19, well, I graduated in 1970, but I stayed to study a little more and work. And about 72, I went to Beirut and I uh, got a job at the Daily Star uh, as a reporter. Uh, and I was lucky to have some tremendous editors, Jihad Khazam, uh, Rafael Kelis, uh, a couple of other people who were terrific editors and great mentors, and they helped helped me a lot. Um, so I started in 1972 in Beirut as a reporter. My first story, you know, I came out of college, you know, hotshot college graduate, Syracuse University, Newhouse School, one of the best in the world still. And here I was reporting for duty, and I wanted to write a story about how to save the Arab world. And the first assignment that Jihad Hazen gave me said, could I write a story about the cockroach problem in, in Beirut? And I said, yes, sir. <laughs> so, so I wrote the, the most densely researched story about cockroaches you'll ever read. Because uh, I was it, to, was it about the politicians or was it about the actual insects? No, back then it was the insects. <laughs> Today it would cover a wide, including some bankers and others. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but the... Um, this, my career started uh, at college. I started doing things in college, but serious uh, work really started in 1972 in Beirut. So when you think about back at that time um, and now with some sort of uh, some perspective and some distance, what does it take to run a very successful institution like that? And what sort of impact do you think um, a, a newspaper like the Daily Star has on society more broadly? Because at the time it was, the, you know, the, the leading English newspaper, English language newspaper in, in Lebanon, local, local. Uh, um, so I'm, I'm curious about some of the, the unexpected challenges that I would find surprising and what it actually takes to, to run an institution like that extremely well. Well, um, I, I didn't run it back then. I was a yeah, reporter, but, but I did yeah. get, they called me back to be editor in 2002. Mm -hmm. And I went uh, gladly because, uh, I, you know, my wife and I both had lived in Beirut. We loved it. And, and I, you know, I couldn't pass up the chance to run the Daily Star, which was then in, 19, in 2002 being published with the Herald Tribune all over the Middle East. It was a great opportunity. Um, but what it takes to run any kind of, publication in the Arab region uh, today, and, and back then as well, though it's more uh, stark today, is you've got to be aware of the real uh, dangerous pressures that could come down on your head if you cross certain lines. You've got to know what's allowed, what's not allowed. Uh, and what that means is what does the uh, ruling authority in each country, and sometimes it's 
another country like in, in Lebanon today, you know, or back then and, and some years ago, you had to worry about what did the Syrians think or what did the Iranians think or what did the Saudis think? So when, when I started with the Daily Star back in 72, uh, it was the Saudis who uh, were the big uh, funder of money of the media. And we had to, it was a big market for, for you know, sales and some advertising. And so we had to, you know, I didn't have to do it much, but the editors had to keep their eye on what are the Saudis uh, concerned about. So you've got to be always aware of where are the, uh, are the red lines. And this raises a really central point, which is if you want to work in the media, in the Arab region or in any country in the South, virtually, with some exceptions only, uh, you've got to be prepared to make some um, sacrifices. And I was conscious of that. And I, I made that decision very early on to work within these systems, even though there were constraints, which I wouldn't have if I was in, in Paris or, or in San Francisco, or there'd be different constraints. <laughs> uh, but... Um, you you gotta that's the major thing that you gotta be worried about. The, the secondary one is that there are other forces than the government, than the authoritarian government system that you have to be careful of. When we when I started in the early seventies, you know, religious institutions and social institutions like tribalism and, and things of that nature, and religious groups were were very powerful in Lebanon. They still are to to a large extent. And also in other countries, so you have to be careful not to offend some of these uh, groups that are not governments. Uh, they're social groups and very meaningful and powerful groups. So you have to. That's the main point that I think you you have, that we had to deal with, and and people still have to deal with it to a certain extent. But being online gives you a lot more uh, leeway. The other thing, of course, is being an English language publication also gave us more leeway because I you know I was talking to, often talked to friends of mine in the Lebanese or the uh, or the uh, Jordanian sometimes Syrian other governments uh, and they would often say look it's in English you know it's okay you can publish this we wouldn't publish it in Arabic so they you know and in fact a lot of the governments would sometimes want to use the English language press to say well okay let let them print this because the foreigners the diplomats the journalists will read this in English, and feel that we have, you know, some freedom of expression and uh, stuff like that, which of course didn't fool the diplomats because none of the stuff that we printed would be printed in Arabic. But it, it's a constant, uh, um, there's a constant tension. Now, I, I went into this, I was very uh, unusually fortunate to become an editor-in-chief of the Daily Star, uh, uh, sorry, of the Jordan Times, in 1975, I, had, I left Beirut when the Civil War started, um, having developed a great career as a, as a reporter of cockroaches and other things, and was doing really well writing for the Financial Times and Washington Post as a stringer and other things. And then I went to Jordan for a visit. And, uh, the, the Civil War started in Lebanon. I, I, I couldn't stay there. It was too dangerous. I wasn't married. So I went to Jordan where my parents had just retired. And, and by chance, my father was involved with some friends who started the Daily the Jordan Times. And they were having a hell of a time uh, running it. They, they had people running it who weren't that capable. And so when they learned from my father that I was there, they said, oh, your son knows English journalism. We're going to see him. So they asked me would I come and run the Jordan Times. And I was 27 years old. And of course, who would not want to be a newspaper editor at the age of 27 if you love journalism and you love the Arab region? So I got to be editor very early, and Jordan is typical. It's a you know a top heavy um, uh, uh, country and political system uh, with a lot of influence from the security and tribal forces and other forces. So you had a lot of constraints, but you but I also sensed that I had to make a decision, which I did, which was I want to work within this system and see if there's a way I can push from within, but more importantly, see if I can help train young journalists. This was back in 75, 76, 77. I can help train young journalists on just how to write a good news story, how to crop a photograph, whatever, how to do an interview, uh, not write political pieces that challenge the whole world, uh, just do the nuts and bolts. Uh, and, and I did that with a conscious uh, awareness that there are some issues that we, we really couldn't write about. And I said, that's okay, I can live with that because the advantages of running the paper were, were meaningful. 
to me. And 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 people who the readers appreciated uh, what we were doing. Uh, and then of course many other little things came along uh, as we were doing our work. We, for instance, we had a story, a couple of, we had a little, I had a report to do a few features on on the pollution of water that uh, was creating some problems for uh, vegetable growers and exporters. And, and one day the information ministry called me and said, Robert, can you come in? We've got to talk about something. And they said, look, this story you're publishing is about vegetables that are uh, 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 grown with polluted water, Maybe they're dangerous. We have to check it out. He said, this is causing problems for us exporting to the Saudi Arabia, which is a big export market for Jordan, fruits and vegetables. And they said, look, could you, could you, could you kind of tone this down a little bit? Uh, and this, things like that happened all the time. And I would always push back a little bit and I'd say, look, but this is true. Who exactly, was, spe- who exactly was speaking to you? People in the information industry. It like literally, matter. like middle management. Hey, so this more, is more senior, upper senior, uh, more than middle, but not the very, very top. Sometimes the minister uh, himself. Once in a while, it would be somebody in the royal court. Uh, now, the irony of this is, these were all people who were friends, people that I'd known as friends, who were friends of my family. They knew me. They trusted me. They knew I wasn't doing subversive stuff intentionally. If you know, because people who were doing subversive stuff like communists or Baathists or whatever, they'd put them in jail. But for me, they, they knew that I wasn't, uh, I had no bad intentions. But they also felt that, you know, they, they had to do something. And I always kind of tried to push back as 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 much as I could um, and say, look, but this is true. And it's also hurting Jordanian citizens. We, you know, this is not good for us. Forget about yeah. exporting tomatoes. And And I would say about one third of the time, I would get my way to say, okay, go ahead, publish it, but you know, take it easy on us. <laughs> okay, so yeah. interesting. So, Rami, I want to ask you about that. So, my instinct, my initial knee-jerk reaction is to say, this is absurd. Um, that you know, these people who work in these ministries and the courts think that you're on their payroll and they think that they get to decide what you publish. Um, but maybe I'm being naive. Maybe that's the case everywhere. Um to what extent is that an extraordinary, extraordinarily absurd story? And to what extent is like that's the nature of media, even in places where we think that there is independent media? You know, it's not only the media, it's the nature of the power structure. So if you look at universities, you look at independent research centers, think tanks, uh, if you look at uh, any other institution, civil society groups that do research on human rights or anything, the government will have the same attitude. It will try to control the generation and dissemination of knowledge that the government thinks makes the country look bad. I mean, that's at its simplest uh, way, uh, explanation. Um, and um, and of course, none of this stuff really hurts the country. In fact, it helps the country when you uh, pu- publish stories about you know polluted water or people stealing money or something. Or, or you know, people being licensed to do things illegally because they're friends of somebody. That that's a good thing for the country to expose. But the people in power don't think like that. They just think of of, uh, of power. Um, and you see it, you know, happening today. You look at Egypt, a great case today, where the country is in real stress, uh, and they and they've cracked down heavily uh, on the media and continue to do so. Some countries in the Gulf, uh, similarly, um, are cracking down. On the media, not all of them, and uh, this is a function of uh, autocratic governance, yeah. um, and it, it just it's universal. It's also timeless. It's been there for you know many many uh, centuries. It's nothing uh, nothing new. But you know the Arab region is kind of unusual, somewhat, in that the the region became a bunch of independent states, twenty two of them at the last count. But even that's not clear because some of them split up, some of them are. We don't know how many Arab states there really are, but in theory, there are 22 in the Arab League. And these are new countries. And most of them were created after World War I uh, by British and colonial um, drunken officers after dinner, drawing maps on uh, napkins and saying, this is your country, this is your country, and picking a local elite to run it. Um, And and that's how these countries developed. And uh, some of them developed with local Dynamism, like in, in Saudi Arabia, uh, the Al Saud uh, took over. Um, each country is slightly, but their own modern uh, creations, 
And not a single one of these Arab countries, with the sole exception of Tunisia a few years ago, but that's now being shattered, not a single Arab country was validated by its citizens, either at its birth or in the policies that continue for decades and, and decades. And this is still the norm, which is unbelievable. We're the only comprehensively, chronically non-democratic entire region in the whole world. There's no other region like us. It used to be like East Europe under the Soviets was like that, but no, not anymore. Only the Arab region is chronically totally non-democratic. And people have struggled and continue to struggle to change this, and it's, it's really hard. Um, but, you know, everybody has to make a decision how you do this. My decision was to try to do it from within. By the way, I was good friends with Jamal Khashoggi, and Jamal and I talked often, and uh, he had a similar approach. He worked within the Saudi media in, in the Gulf, and he felt the same thing, that, you know, it's better to work in the system. He was editing a newspaper, then he tried to start a TV station and and then he, he joined the government. So he, he felt that it's better to try to work within the system to try to uh, push things as much as you can. And many other people uh, like us have done the same thing. Of course, he paid for it with, with his life. Um, and uh, this is a common uh, challenge across the entire Arab region today, with no exceptions. There used to be exceptions, by the way, uh, uh, recently, until about six, eight, ten years ago. There were a few countries where you had more pluralism, more freedom of expression, a little bit more space to, to do things. Jordan was one, Morocco was one, Kuwait a little bit, Lebanon a lot, Palestine a lot, had more space than other countries. But all of those have now started to, sh to shut down that uh, yeah. space. There, there's more restrictions now in, in all of these countries. Uh, so this is a great... Uh, a great dilemma, and and the young populations in the Arab countries are trying to figure out how to overcome this. Yeah. The uprisings of 2010-11 were, were an unbelievably historic development where the entire region virtually rose up in a public display of a human cry for dignity, freedom, pluralism, whatever, and, uh, and got uh, sh smashed down uh, mostly by their own governments, sometimes with other Arab and foreign governments uh, helping them, as is still uh, still the case. So the young people today are still trying to figure out uh, how to do this, and nobody has an answer. But uh, at one point in the next five, seven, ten years, there's going to be another big wave of internally driven, serious reform in our region. And nobody can tell where and why and how it's going to start, but there's no doubt it will, because you can't have a region as we do with 70% of the population living on in or on the edge of poverty with no political rights, very poor social protection, insurance, uh, um, pension funds, etc. You know, people living on the edge of destitution. And now we have really good, serious studies by academics in the region internationally that show us that these generations now, the one, the young people born today, the ones born in the last 10, 15 years, these poor people, vulnerable, poor, marginalized people will be like this for another two or three generations. This is chronic and intergenerational. You can't suddenly uh, bring a country that's 70% uh, poor to a situation where it's only 30% poor. You could do that in the 50s and 60s. The Arab region did that, which is, we had an amazing spurt of growth with the government spending, foreign aid, uh, private sector, all kinds of things. You can't do that today. The population is way too big. Egypt has 2 million new citizens every year. The Arab population yeah. in 1930 was 60 million. The Arab population today is around 440 million. Water resources are... Uh, insufficient arable land is, uh, is threatened and destroyed. Oh, you know, all kinds of trends are negative uh, all over the region. So it's not easy to take the socioeconomic stresses of our region and deficiencies and inequities and try to change them quickly, as we were able to do in the 50s, 60s, 70s. So this is the great uh, challenge that young people are trying to address. Many give up and leave, and yeah. we can't blame them. 
uh, especially if they have young kids. And, but others continue to stay there, uh, like yourself and others, and they keep working and struggling. And and one day they will they will break through. The media will reflect that. <laughs> well, there's there's no there's no indication that one day they will break through. I was Not with now. you. I Not was now. with you. I was with you until that final sentence. <laughs> there's no there's no um, clear indication that that's the eventuality. Um, but let me ask you about your op- optimism. Um, if you were to sort of track your optimism about the future of the region, if I had sat down with you and did a, a one minute interview with you every single year from the year you graduated, which I, I think you said was 1968. Um, if I sat down and asked you a poll, a survey of one question every single year, how optimistic are you about the future of the Arab world? Um, when do you think you were at your apex of optimism? And when do you think you were at your uh, 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 nadir of optimism? I think the key word in your question is future. So for the present, there's, there's, I'm not optimistic for today, obviously, but nobody is. Um, but for the future, I'm definitely optimistic. I expect at some point in the future, whether it's 5, 10, 30, who, nobody knows, at some point in the years, some point there's going to be a, a great reckoning. And these autocratic regimes, um, these, these very you know, militaristic uh, autocratic regimes are, are going to be thrown out or forced to change. Some, some regimes you know, are changed peacefully. South Africa, the old Soviet Union, if you're probably too young to remember the, the old Soviet Union, but they changed, they became Russia. Now they're doing terrible things today in Ukraine and other places. They're still rather autocratic, but they changed, uh, their empire fell apart. And, uh, so some regimes change peacefully, but most of them don't. They have to be pushed out or forced out or so, in some way. Yeah. And uh, the Arab region uh, is unusual in that the whole region, as I said, is autocratic. Uh, but the whole region has been in rebellion of some sort. Now, the few countries that are different are the very wealthy uh, oil and energy producing countries in the Gulf. The um, they're they're always a little different because their populations are smaller. They have a tremendous amount of money, and therefore they don't feel among their people the same intensity of degradation and humiliation and helplessness that people feel in Jordan and Syria and Libya and, and Morocco and, and Egypt and all, all over the place. In Palestine, you have the added problem of the uh, settler colonial apartheid system, which keeps worsening with the new Israeli government. Uh, every country has its particularities, uh, but there is this common problem across the region that the citizen has no rights. You know, we were, we were a region that, first of all, had no real citizenship back in the Ottoman Empire, we were something, we were part of the Ottoman Empire. And then suddenly we became nation states after 1920, 25, and all of these states came into being. And suddenly there was these citizens with constitutions and theory that had rights, but in practice they didn't. And in the last 30, 40 years, really since the Reagan-Thatcher years of around 1980, when globalization, commercialization, uh, um, um, uh, digitization, all of these things, free market economies dominated the whole world, the, our citizens were transformed actually into consumers. So we now have consumers, and every Arab country, if you look at the newspapers, I, when I travel to Arab countries, I always look at the local Arabic language newspapers, just look at the advertisements, it's extraordinary the amount of stuff being sold to people at very reasonable prices. And if you don't have enough money, they'll give you a loan. Cars and houses and, and uh, you know, uh, 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 vacuum cleaners and anything you want, and, and as many kinds of fried chicken as you want. Uh, so the, the reality of this region is that there are 440 million citizens, in theory, who are actually only consumers. Yeah. And they're voiceless. They can't really express themselves except anonymously on social media, and they're powerless. They don't have the power to change their systems through voting or legal systems or other peaceful uh, means. Um, And so there's pressure constantly building. Of course, it exploded in the wave of 210, 211 uprisings. Some of those continued in Lebanon, Algeria, Sudan, Iraq, and and some of them are still going on quietly, but no breakthroughs. So at some point... um, um, that something will happen. The reason I have long-term optimism 
is because I've spent the last 52 years, about since 1970, um, constantly reporting across the Arab region. I've traveled a lot in the, in the Arab region. I've been to most, but not all Arab countries. And I've also met Arabs at conferences and all kinds of things. So every, my optimism is anchored in a recognition of the extraordinary humanity, dignity, uh, and, and, and law-abiding uh, nature of, of the average Arab citizen. Uh, and this comes from a tradition of, of many things that you know, you looked at in history and sociology yeah. and culture and, and things. But that's what makes me feel uh, optimistic. When you look at younger people today at universities, as I do, but also in civil society, there's an unbelievable dynamism, creativity, determination, uh, ingenuity. They're doing a crazy stuff, which is really positive, good stuff, uh, using technology, using uh, trying to network across the region. So that power, that human power to do well and to build decent societies uh, is there. It exists inside the individual and the collective humanity of the Arab region. How to get it out and help it shape the public realm and policies and things of that nature uh, is the big challenge uh, that we still face. It's not yeah. going to happen quickly. Uh, and it, uh, people die all the time from you know demonstrating and uh, challenging their systems, uh, but human nature, I think, in the end, has to has to triumph. The, the existing systems are not sustainable. You don't have enough foreign aid to come in and keep these systems uh, keep the, the lid on using security measures. Uh, the, the the term I use to describe the Arab region today um, is a, a a citizenship a citizens in rebellion against a, a militarized state. The, the states are increasingly using military and, and related tactics like taking people to court and imprisoning them. The, the, the militarized state is trying to keep the lid on uh, the protests of the citizens and demands for change. And the citizens are find, trying to find new ways to protest and bring, bring about change. That system cannot go on forever because there simply is not enough money in these countries to feed all the government uh, employees and, and security services and let citizens have a decent uh, life and generate jobs, good education, healthcare, the, all these things that we were doing in the 40s, 50s, 60s, even until the late 70s, the development of the Arab world was really quite impressive. In yeah. many cases, moving faster than places like East Asia, which were held up as the jewel of of, of global development. We're yeah. educating women at a faster pace in the Arab well, world than, yeah. than they were in East Asia in some periods. So that's yeah. why I'm optimistic. Uh, okay. Um, okay, thanks for that. I appreciate the dose of optimism. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna ask you one final question before we move on to the quick Q&A, which is, um, and I'm gonna put you on the spot with this. Obviously, um, I will say that um, you get a pass for if you lose any, if you miss, uh, if you don't think of any uh, of these books off the top of your head, but I'm going to put you on the spot. What are sort of five, six books that every single, you know, journalist, um, master's student or public policy uh, student who's interested in the Arab world should absolutely have on their bookshelf? If you're interested in the Arab region? Specifically, if you're interested in the Arab region, if you want to participate in um, these, you know, work at one of these think tanks or work in media, um, work as a journalist, what are required reading as far as you're concerned? Oh, I would certainly say The Arab Awakening by George Antonius, which was written back in, I think, the 40s, um, 50s, I can't remember which year he wrote it, about the Nahda, The Arab Awakening. Mm -hmm. um, I think you have to read um, uh, books about colonialism and, and anti-colonialism, and there's many, uh, many that have been written. Uh, I'd have to think specifically uh, of one or two, but uh, the whole colonial enterprise. Um, there's one book that was written a few years ago that I wrote, read, whose, whose name I, I can't exactly remember. Uh, it was something like How the West Stole Democracy from the Arabs. It's written by a professor in the United States, a history professor, about how the, the British and the French colluded to prevent uh, Prince Faisal in 1920 
from creating a constitution in Syria that gave citizens their rights and and had the monarchy in a kind of informal state uh, to try to create a, a democratic system. That's uh, Elizabeth F. Thompson. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, uh, how to how the, that's an incredible book. It's so important to read because both for the impulse from within the Arab region for democratic reforms while respecting certain uh, historical realities like tribalism, religion, uh, monarchy, etc., and the fierce determination of the West. Uh, uh, the third one I would say is uh, Elan Pape's The Eth- Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, which was about Palestine. But Zionism and, and the Israeli reality, which today we see becoming more and more gruesome, um, really are a central part of this story. And we don't have time to get into it, but I, I, I always say that the four reasons why the Arab region is so messed up today, so violent, so erratic, is autocratic control by militaries in the Arab world, uh, lack of uh, democracy, uh, poor policy making that, that doesn't give citizens their rights, and external interference militaristically since Napoleon, not 1920, 1789. Since Napoleon, for 200 and a quarter years, Western governments have been coming into our region with their bombs and their cannons and their armies and intervening, and they're still doing it today. If you look at all the American and British interventions and whatever, and Israel and Zionism is part of this Western military invasion in a colonial settler form. So understanding the nature of uh, Israel and its relation to the region and why people all over the region, 80%, always say that Palestine is an important issue to them. Governments are different, <clears throat> but citizens uh, still feel strongly. So I think the ethnic cleansing of Palestine certainly would be one. There's a book I just read, uh, The Nutmeg's Curse. Uh, uh, and the author is an Indian whose name uh, I have, uh, uh, Amit- Amitav Ghosh, I think his name is. The Nutmeg's Curse, unbelievable book about colonialism in the Netherlands and Southeast Asia in the 1500s, and colonialism from Britain to the United States, looking at the colonial traditions in the world, what they did, massacres, all the terrible things they did, and how that period still influences much of what we see going on, uh, uh, much what, what we see going on uh, today. Um, and finally, the um, I think the book that I recommend is The Political Economy of the Arab World. Uh, it was written originally by John Waterbury, and I can't remember his co-author. It's been updated recently by Melanie Kamet and uh, Ishaq Diwan, I believe, The Arab Political Economy of the Arab World. Uh, unbelievably important to understand how the systems today uh, operate the political economy that political forces, autocratic forces control the economy. So those are a few books that I think are really uh, important because they capture powerful trends that still dominate. What do you think is the best book specifically about journalism? Not necessarily in the Arab world, but sort of a a companion a companion book and sort of uh, <laughs> a a guide to journalism. <laughs> Well, I don't think there is one. Uh, people haven't written about it because people who know journalism also understand that there's not a lot to say beyond what I just said. <laughs> you know, mm, that yeah. Governing powers control the system and the expression of free thought. And 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 therefore, journalism is not really developing uh, on a commercial wide scale really well, except for the pockets of the independent uh, digital media who are doing it. Yeah. But I don't think there is a book that I can think of right now that uh, that that captures that. Okay, before we do the quick Q and A, I have another question for you. Um, what are some of the books that you you wish you uh, saw? Like you walk into a bookstore and all of a sudden you you find you happen upon these books that you didn't even know were in process, mm-hmm. and they are each one of them is about one of the fundamental problems and issues face, the Arab world is facing right now. You you sort of alluded to some of them earlier. You said, you know, we don't have enough water. 
Um, are there issues that you think to yourself, I wish somebody wrote a book about this. I'm dying to read the book. I don't really want to write it, but I'm mm -hmm. dying to read it. What are some of the issues that you think, I wish somebody wrote a book about this? Well, there are many, but a, a couple of the real key ones I would mention are, well, by the way, I wrote an article, I, I gave a talk at a conference a few years ago, which was then later developed into an article that was the lead article of a book that came out about three, four years ago. And uh, the, the name of the title of it is um, uh, uh, um, I have to think because <laughs> it's been a couple of years since I wrote it. It's about critical moments uh, or early warning signs, early warning signs in the Arab region that we missed and still miss. And I went back 40, 50 years to the 70s until today, and I pointed out to 10 different early warning signs that were happening. And we, me and others wrote about these things when they were happening, but the world didn't pay attention because it's still a colonial world. Today is still a colonial world. And the colonial motherland in North America and, and Europe and, and Russia and other places doesn't care about what ordinary people feel or think or do in our region. But these early warning signs, I think, capture some of the main points that um, I wish people would write detailed uh, books on. Now, I'm working on a book, by the way, now as I, as I approach retirement. I'm going to be 75 at the end of this year. <clears throat> but I'm in good health and still most, mostly there in mind. I'm going to write a book that goes back over my own 54 years of uh, experience in public life and journalism and um, writing and things and the, public, the nature of society in, in our region and how it's evolved over all these years, all based on firsthand accounts, things I've written, at conferences I attended where I took notes, interviews I did, lectures I gave, and articles I wrote. And it's not about me, it's about our region as it's as I experienced it and tried to document it. And it'll be a way to go back and say, well, here's what happened over all these years. Here's what people said and what they thought and what they ignored and what they didn't do anything about. But in that context, <clears throat> I would say the, mo the single most important factor in the current condition of our region has been the control of government by military men old men with guns, I call them. They, some of them start young, but then they stay for a long time, become old men with guns. So the, the military and security forces control of so much of our region uh, is the single greatest debilitating factor because it touches everything else, economic policy, environmental preservation, yeah. opportunity, education, social justice, etc. So that's one thing that really needs a, a, a serious scholar to, to go over it and, and, and just look at all of these different uh, countries one by one. Each one is a little bit different than the other, but they all have this common uh, denominator. Uh, the second one, which is, is, a, is, a, is a function of that, is the voiceless Arab man and woman, the voicelessness of Arabs. Arab men and women are, are what Ralph Ellison in the writing about American blacks called invisible people. That we don't exist. We, we don't exist in reality. We don't have rights. We don't have voice. We don't have power. We don't have influence. Uh, we just, we're just there. We're consumers. That's all we're allowed to do, consume. Uh, so somebody needs to write about what happens when 440 million men and women are voiceless powerless, helpless, but also uh, increasingly stressed out and in many cases desperate. So it's, it, it's, it would be the tale of the, uh, the, the evolution uh, of, the, of the Arab citizenry uh, into a bad state that it's in today for the most part. About 20% of the Arab people live really well you know, professionals and people near the government and whatever, but most of them don't. And it's getting worse, not getting better, by the way. Uh, the inequalities are increasing. and So those are two factors that <clears throat> I would mention. The third one is the incredibly um, clear now environmental deterioration in our region. Um, people started writing about this back in the 70s and 80s, 
when the oil boom started and development picked up really fast paced. But the, the environmental deterioration, land, water, uh, air quality, uh, other factors, <clears throat> um, has now become a huge uh, element in citizen dissatisfaction, which translates into anger and ultimately um, people immigrate or they join uh, violent movements or something, or they become corrupt. So the, the, the environmental nature of our problems, I think, is really a big issue. And it's going to become more and more important as climate change has more and more uh, impact. Um, yeah. Uh, so those are three big ones. You want more? Or is that no, that's great. That's fantastic. <laughs> um, okay, let's do the quick Q&A, then we're going to wrap up. So these are rapid fire questions. The first one is, what are you reading or watching these days? I'm reading about two things. Um, so reading and watching, I don't know what I'm reading. I, I don't, I watch mostly sports and comedies on TV. Uh, Great choices. <laughs> most of the other stuff is it's just entertainment. I watch a little bit of news here and there, but but most of my news I get from good online, you know, quality. Whether some of them are traditional, like the New York Times, sometimes not always, and people like that, um, or the Arab social media. But reading, I'm reading about two things that really define my life and what I'm doing more and more. I read a lot about colonialism and resistance because it's clear that the colonial legacy from the starting from the Ottoman period to the European colonials today to the other colonial powers, the United States, the Russians, the Iranians, the Turks, uh, the Israelis. Um, so the colonial powers evolve in our region, but uh, the colonial system is still in, in uh, play. So I read a lot about uh, how colonialism um, works and how people resist it. I'm particularly interested in the links between the American civil rights movement uh, by blacks and other people of color, but mostly black Americans, and Palestinian resistance. And this is something that we're, we're looking to do some links between them. Interesting, so yeah. that's one area, colonialism and anti-colonialism. Um, and the and of course, if you want to, if you want a lesson in colonialism, just look at what's going on in Israel. Israel is the last active colonial enterprise, settler colonial enterprise from the 19th century. There's no other movement that started in the 19th century and continues in the 21st, except for Zionism, where they keep taking Palestinian land and other Arab land. They took Syria, they took a little bits of Lebanon. And uh, so the colonial enterprise is a living one in the case of Zionism and Israel, which is an incredible uh, reality that more and more people are waking up to uh, around the world. The other thing that I'm reading a lot about is, is writing. Um, after all these uh, half a uh, this half a century of journalism, I've decided that what I, what I like to do, and I think what I do best is, is, is I write things and what writing is, is essentially choosing words and putting them in a row. The, the practical, <laughs> logistical part of writing, not coming yeah. up with great ideas or great theories or being sure. courageous to challenge the, the great leader. No, it's how do you put words in a sentence that succeed, and success is that the reader reads it and goes on to the next sentence, and then the next one. So I'm doing more workshops, teaching people how to write effectively, all kinds of writing, whether you do tweets or dissertations or whatever, love letters or death threats, whatever you write, um, I'm trying to read, uh, understand better how writing can be improved. And I try to improve my writing and other people's writings. And this includes now reading articles about the brain, because there's been incredible breakthroughs in the last 20 years about scanning the brain to see what happens in your brain physically when you read something that you like or you watch a movie that you like, different parts of your brain light up. And we know a lot more about this now than we did before. So I'm trying to bring that knowledge to the writers who I teach and train. Say, look, if you want to succeed in your headline or your caption or your first lead sentence, here's what you got to do because you got to connect to this part of the brain which generates curiosity, empathy, and a willingness to keep reading. And, and so we know now physiologically 
Uh, and in terms of you know hormones and, and chemicals in the brain, we know what kind of words to put together to stimulate the reaction that we want from readers. And this is yeah. incredibly uh, fascinating and, and and loads of fun. So those are, I read a lot about those two uh, those two uh, things. Okay. All right. We're gonna. Um do the next couple ones. We only have a few minutes. Okay, so who would you love to shadow for a day, past or present? Wow. Um, past or present? Could be uh, a sports figure. Feel free. Yeah. That's hard. Uh, you, you snuck up on me with that question. There's so many people that I would uh, have and do admire. <clears throat> uh, I, I think, obviously, Nelson Mandela would be one. Uh, because he demonstrates this humility as an incredible reaction to, as a, a form of resistance to brutality. And this is, I think, so important. And I feel it in my interaction with Israel and Israelis that, that you need to be calm and not overreact, make clear what your views are, stick to your views, and keep presenting them and pointing out why your adversary is uh, is, is a criminal. And why that criminality can continue. So Mandela probably would be the one most dramatic uh, okay. person that I would, uh, cool. would like to shadow for a day. What do people most misunderstand about your work? Those who criticize me, and there's been a lot of them over the years, misunderstand that I'm trying to look at the Arab region within the Arab region in its relations with foreign powers, mostly Western powers, but now increasingly, you know, Russia, Turkey, Israel, UAE, you know, other Arab powers now that are trying to act like colonial powers. They misunderstand that I try to analyze these Arab relations uh, within the region and externally in a manner that tries to give everybody let everybody enjoy their rights equally. So Israelis, Palestinians, Arabs, foreigners, whatever. Um, people misunderstand often what I write as, you know, just I'm attacking them um, and they uh, they criticize me for different things. And I, I, you know, I get a kick out of this when people s s send a tweet that says, you know, I'm a, a anti-Semitic uh, nutcase or something. I just give them a heart sign as, you know, I love you keep going, or once in a while I'll write, nice try, no cigar. Now just, you yeah. know, flippantly saying, you know, you're way off the mark, I'm not going to argue with you. And people then yeah. try to create an argument, because this is the this is the, the tactics of these sure. uh, openers. They try to get you to divert into this and that. Uh, but humility, I think, is an important part of this. And what people misunderstand is I'm just trying to understand as a journalist, how can we improve these societies in our region um, on the basis of social justice and equal rights under law for everybody, including Israelis, Iranians, Saudis, yeah. everybody. So I'm still at it, and I hope my book, when I do it in the next year or two, will will yeah. will make this clear. All right, last question. I'm gonna I'm gonna since you mentioned uh, sports, I'm very curious. What athlete do you admire the most, or are inspired by? Um. That's another uh, tough one. I think it would have to go back to uh, Mickey Mantle of the New York Yankees from the late 50s and early 60s. Uh, and, you know, he had, like most athletes back then, uh, baseball players, you know, half of them were drunkards and they'd go out all night and and, um, and go to, you know, parties with all kinds of women and, who were not their wives and, and do uh, crazy things and get drunk and come to the game next day hungover. But uh, Mickey, uh, Mickey Mantle uh, struck me as a, uh, I've read several books about him, as a person who persevered through incredible problems. He had physical problems, and he was always playing in pain and banded it up and stuff, but he was one of the greatest hitters of all time. Um, yes. And he, uh, he basically was a role model for so many uh, young people uh, uh, but so I think he's a lesson in, in great talent that faced adversity, reacted with a combination of, of human greatness and human frailty at the same time. In mm -hmm. other words, none of us are perfect. We're all, you know, flawed human beings. 
uh, and uh, so, uh, but I still admire uh, Mickey Mantle. The other one would, would be uh, 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 um, um, the, the young players who broke the color ban in um, in baseball um, in the in the 1950s. Jack, uh, Jackie Robinson. Jackie Robinson and one or two others. What they endured, but they also, you know, stuck with it, and and they were incredibly important historical sure. uh, figures. Um, Rami, thanks so much for joining us. I really appreciate it, uh, and you know, thanks for letting me sneak up on you with all those questions. Uh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for the good work you do. Thank you.